they changed the angle of the tripod a little. That no, problem. That is just a snow. I mean, you can just see that. Ah, not. Good
a lot of it is associated with um, negative reinforcement from peers or too much positive reinforcement from parents. Um, another more surprising cause of underachievement is actually undiagnosed learning disorders. Individuals with high IQ are actually prone to learning disorders, but they're not diagnosed because these individuals are more readily able to compensate for them. Another one is depression. And depression as society most tends to view it, tends to be found in individuals who are profoundly gifted in things such as performing arts, visual arts, uh, writing, things of that nature, but most individuals with high IQ are prone to existential depression, which is to say that they're more aware of things like the finality of death, um, the meaning or lack thereof of life, and the ultimate unimportance of the individual. Of course, most individuals with high IQ are prone to communication problems. They have a tendency to have encyclopedic knowledge and much faster information processing. Everything becomes a problem that they have to solve. And so they have trouble making small talk, which relates to a little bit of social awkwardness. That does lead to stressors that a lot of individuals that do not have such a profound IQ don't face. And it's difficult for them to recognize that. So now we're going to go into some of the psychological disorders. The first of which is schizophrenia. And schizophrenia is actually anatomically found in high IQ individuals because of a gene called the DARPP32 gene, which improves information processing in this area of the prefrontal cortex. And it also controls the circuit to the striatum, where things such as motivation and certain types of learning occur. So the two are actually connected, and they find that circuit to function differently in individuals with a high IQ. The next is autism. There is a certain type of autism that high IQ individuals are more prone to. Um, it, it's basically they have a higher capacity in certain areas that they may find themselves interested in, but extremely low capacities in others, such as performing extremely well in math, but then really not doing well at all in English. Unfortunately, a lot of high IQ individuals are more prone to eating disorders. This is more common in adolescence. Uh, they find that there's a lot of parental pressure put on adolescents when they're distinguished as a high IQ individual early on in life. Um, so as they grow, they're more prone to things such as anorexia, bulimia, just because of societal pressure. <coughs> So the most important thing we can do as a society for these individuals is to really understand these psychological and these psychosocial disorders and contribute more to the success of these individuals than the pressures of their achievements. And we're actually going to do questions at the end. So thank you all. I hope you learned a little bit and enjoy the presentation. <laughs> Yes. Jen, did any of your research go into the goodness or poorness of the, of the educational environment and how that impacted their um, adjustment? Uh, yes, actually. A lot of gifted programs are unfortunately cut off after like the fifth grade. Um, gifted individuals are normally accepted into educational programs with an IQ of above 120. So, unfortunately, the individuals floating at that like 110 to 120 range often don't get the correct amount of the educational need either. But once the students enter middle school, a lot of their gifted programs are diminished, which is very unfortunate because middle school is one of the toughest times for adjustment in society. So, at that point, there is a huge gap. and the societal pressures do start to hit on those individuals, and adolescence is the period when most of these psychosocial and psychological disorders do start to come into play. So it is unfortunate that most of the gifted programs are diminished, and that's why I think awareness is super, super important, because then maybe we can improve on that education system. Yes. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned a lot about depression and uh, 
negative like issues. Uh, did you, I mean, I assume it's correlated with low self-esteem, but did you find any specific studies or anything that looked at like the self-esteem of high individuals? Because like one thing that I was thinking is that they would be able to latch onto the fact that they do have superior abilities, but I didn't know if the um, negative, like the isolation and the negative consequences sort of um, overpower those the things that that time and like how that would affect their self-esteem specifically. Right. Um, I did look into one study, actually, forgive me, I cannot remember the psychologist's name that saved my life at the moment, but um, he explored a little bit of that. And I didn't touch on depression too much because, like I said, it, it's a very, it's a very gray area at the moment because most individuals do experience existential depression. Um, but he found that those individuals with the abilities of, of performing arts and visual arts did experience depression as a whole. And a lot of that was because of that isolation. So in that case, he found that the social consequences did outweigh their ability to latch on to the fact that they do have superior intelligence. Just because they couldn't make friends very well, because they couldn't make small talk. And even though they were superior in intelligence, they felt very inferior because they practiced a lot of underachievement. Okay. Yes? Did you find in your research any correlation between uh, personality types and IQ? I did. I researched um, Carl Jung's personality types and correlated that with the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator. Um, most of the higher IQ individuals tended to be INFP or ISTJ. Uh, it did tend to be higher in introverts than in extroverts. Um, there were a couple of other factors involved, but the interesting thing that I found about that was that the INFPs actually scored higher on all of the IQ tests, but when asked by peers who didn't know their IQs which group had the higher IQ, the INFPs were scored the lowest because they have a tendency to put things in layman's terms rather than using big words like Sabiculum, striatum, all those <laughs> fun things. <laughs> so. Question over here. Yes. I, I, I hear you mentioned the um, perspective from outsiders looking at gifted you know, people. Mm -hmm. uh, did your research I, um, see any correlate or comparisons between cultures, such as Asian cultures to American or Western cultures, um, where Westerners are more prone to believe that something is innate? It's get somebody born with it as opposed to um, Asian or Eastern cultures. They believe it is developed through work and um, training. I actually looked at um, Jonathan Levy and Jacob Tucker, and they did a lot of research into the cultural variation. And they found that actually Western society does associate a stigma with being gifted. They feel it's not innate. They feel that Westerners look down upon anything that is not considered normal and try to change gifted individuals to become more of a, whereas other cultures in, in Europe, um, a couple of them in Europe, more than Eastern Europe, of course, uh, the Asian societies and everything, they actually look to those people more, they, they look highly upon those people, they respect those people a lot more because they feel it is an inborn gift. Do they identify them with work as far as like that those people have developed it and earned it as opposed to being born with it? Uh, that I actually don't know. I can look into that one for you, but I'm not sure about that one. I know you only touched lightly on things that can be done, mm -hmm. you know, to change things, but did you do a lot of research that they show success stories that could be are very valid when you said they're common sense, um, but how people with the higher IQs can kind of break some of those patterns? Did you find any research showing success on breaking something like depression? A couple of them, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the most common success stories I found actually were parents who were also high IQ because the parents then didn't put as much pressure on their children and a lot of the pressure does unfortunately begin in the home. Once a child, like if a child gets diagnosed, or not diagnosed, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a disease. <laughs> with a higher IQ, yeah. the pressure starts right then. And yeah. you have to figure from first grade through the rest of their life, yeah. if they're dealing with it in the home, 
Yeah. Imagine what it's like dealing with it at school and then coming home and having to deal with it again. Mm -hmm. sure. So, okay. yes? Were there any, um, or did you find any differences between like kids in a, like at home who have siblings who also have high IQs or don't have high IQs? Um, the only study I found on that, unfortunately, was the study of twins okay. uh, by Drs. Bouchard and Siegel. And they did find that if both of the twins, which in most cases they did, if both of the twins had higher IQs, the parents actually did not put as much pressure on them. Because then it's not like, oh, well, you should be more like your brother. Because they both experience the same things, both in society and academically. So. Yes? Um, do you have any uh, ideas as to how it could be brought to attention to the public or things of that nature? Um, like I said, the most important thing is awareness. Uh, I mean, it, it started in this room. It started in this room by just me saying, hey, this is what's going on. We all should be aware of that. And, you know, it, it's honestly, it's up to us. It's up to the ones who are educated on it to go out and say, you know, this is important. People often look at individuals with lower IQs and tend to forget that people with higher IQs can have the same psychosocial and psychological disorders. Mm -hmm. And it's important to bring that to the forefront and say, you know, these people do need these gifted programs. They need this certain form of education. Otherwise, we're all going to end up in an insane asylum. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> so, yeah. so earlier you made a joke that having a high IQ is illness and everyone thought that was really funny. And yeah, in psychosocial uh, problems, the solution would be to have a more enlightened society or a better support system, whatever. But there's some non-psychosocial problems, like the of autism, which are not uh, nature nurture dependent. They're right. going to presumably be triggered regardless of what environment you grow up in. Right. So here's a sort of controversial question. Um, given that high IQ increases prevalence of schizophrenia and autism, and presumably probably other uh, psychological, not psychosocial diseases mm -hmm. or disorders, why isn't higher IQ a maladjustment itself? Why isn't it considered a disease? Um, that, that is a very interesting question, actually. Um, I mean, some diseases have benefits, right? right. So there are, there are uh, is it sickle cell anemia? It's not yeah. sickle cell that makes you immune to malaria yeah. or makes yes. you immune to malaria. Yes. So not all diseases are purely negative. Some have benefits. So why isn't it, right. why wouldn't it be considered a disease by biologists if it's going to lead to Actually, I feel like it's probably the same case as sickle cell anemia. Um, people see the, the benefits of having a high IQ, which in itself is an anatomical difference. Individuals with a higher IQ have deformities in the frontal lobes of their brain that actually make them smaller than a regular individual. So it is in itself anatomically different for individuals with a high IQ, and I feel it's the same thing. I feel like looking at that people realize, okay, we have this person who has a 170 IQ, they have underlying schizophrenia, if we start treating this DARPP32 gene to try to eliminate the schizophrenia, what's going to happen to that IQ? And I think people are afraid to delve into that study right now. <clears throat> yes? Would you say the honors program in college has helped you, and if it has, would you say that if you extended it towards high school and middle school, you could capture those gifted students, get them, you know, interacting with their peers, increase their social skills? What would you say about that? Um, you know, I can only speak from experience of my personal honors college. I obviously haven't worked with any of the other honors colleges enough, unfortunately, to be able to make that call for them. Uh, personally, my honors college at Valencia College is phenomenal about that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, we have an absolutely wonderful, wonderful support system. We have um, our director, Dr. Valerie Burks, our assistant director, our entire honor student advisory committee, advisors at each of our campuses, and honors professors who are mentors to the students that we can reach out to at any point in time. And a lot of them, unfortunately, went through the same things that we're going through. You know, they all had to find themselves through college, and they had to fight through this experience of, oh, crap, I have a high IQ, and everybody else looks at me like I'm ridiculous. So it, it is a wonderful support system that we have at our honors college. I, I hope the rest of you have the, have the same experience at your honors colleges. Um, as far as extending that to middle and high school, 
they do offer a lot of honors classes in middle and high school. Unfortunately, it's different than having an honors program. Um, an honors class in middle or high school, say you do exceptionally well in English, they'll put you next year into an honors English class. And that's a lot different than being enrolled in a full-on honors program. The support system just, it, it's not the same. There aren't particular honors advisors. Um, I think if they extended an honors program to middle and high schools, that might help. But the way the system is set up right now in most locations, it just, it doesn't do the same thing. One more question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, to, to ask if you studied the uh, cultural development of this country. A number of our founding fathers were very enlightened and highly educated. Yes. When did we make the shift from that kind of leadership to normalcy? <laughs> 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 Do you want me to answer this from a political standpoint? Or? <laughs> <laughs> fathers were extremely intelligent and I mean you look back over time and some of our authors um, even to the time of like Bobby Fischer yeah, these individuals were remarkably intelligent we're talking Bobby Fischer had a, a 187 IQ and these individuals were just remarkably intelligent um, probably about I'm gonna say the early 1900s was when we really started shifting into this period of everything sort of becoming a disease. Um, if you look back over time, that's when electroshock therapy started coming into play in our, in our society for anything that wasn't considered normal. And at that point, a lot of high IQ individuals were put through that because there was a stigma associated with them. Um, and unfortunately, that was just added by society. We wanted to remain superior, and so anything that was found to be out of the norm was unfortunately put down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.